Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you, Magda and Sarit, for your hospitality. And also, I'd like to extend a thank you to Anita and Miriam at the Center for Jewish History for their hospitality every week. Oh, yes. Where's the mic? Ah, okay. Um, I, I've had a wonderful time in New York so far and um, beginning to feel very sad that I'm already leaving in a week. Um, and uh, what I want to do today is essentially um, present to you a um, slightly more focused version of what uh, the blurb of my talk announced, which was the book project that was previously announced on Taoism and capitalism, and uh, showcase at least one of the things that I was able to look at at the Leo Beck Institute uh, with the support of the fellowship. So once again, thank you very much, and I'm very happy to be able to present some of my work to you. Um, Title's obviously a little changed. It's now Taoism Organization Experimentation, the case of Bolton Spike and Benjamin. So part one, Bogeschichte, Modernity, China. Uh, which I open with an epigraph. In any event, the nature theater of Oklahoma points back to Chinese theater, which is a justic one. One of this nature theater's most significant functions is the dissolution of occurrence into the justic, from Walter Benjamin's essay on Franz Kafka. Now, in December 1934, Walter Benjamin sent Theodor Adorno a copy of this essay, his recently completed essay on Franz Kafka, and in return, Adorno sent back a lengthy and comprehensive commentary in which he declares, typically, that Benjamin seems not to have yet fully worked out the idea behind the things that populate Kafka's figurative world, the creatures, animals, assistants, fools, students, and gestures that seem intended for nothing, to go nowhere, and appear to bypass any straightforward attempt at deriving significance from them, whether psychological or existential. According to Adorno, when Benjamin describes these figures as functions of pre-worldly forces, he fails to consider the possibility that they might merely appear to us as ciphers of the age of the world as such, my translation of the word Weltalter. That is to say that they might in fact be an extrapolation of the petrified present, der versteinten Gegenwart, of an age within the world, or epoch, Zeitalter, which registers as our loss of the concept of epoch or indeed of any other marker of historical progress. In Adorno's view, therefore, Benjamin's characterization of Kafka's as a swamp world, whose elements rise up into hineinragen, the present, in and as a function of their forgottenness, thus remains mired in the archaic, having, quote, not been thoroughly dialecticized. And this, according to Adorno, amounts to one overarching problem, that, Quote, the relation between prehistory and modernity has yet to be conceptualized. Now, I open with this exchange for several reasons. First, the episode captures a debate of early Frankfurt School critical theory, how to treat myth in the contemporary. For Adorno, it is imperative to grasp myth as a symptom of our modern condition, and therefore myths thorough dialectization, durch dialectisieren, as bearing the hope for the sublation of this condition. Thus, for instance, Odredek, the star-like spindle-shaped quasi-supernatural creature that tarries in various locations associated with judgments of guilt in Kafka's story, Cares of a Family Man, ought, for Adorno, to be interpreted as a sign that reified and vanished life, dinghaf verkehrte Neben, can nevertheless transcend the boundary imposed by the naturalization of the conditions leading to reification and therefore survive them. Benjamin, by contrast, reads Odredek as epitomizing the form that things take in their forgottenness, as the distortion in Stello that unsettles the ground on which the age of naturalized guilt had been erected within the world, qua Zeitalter. Distortion does this by registering the spatial and temporal boundaries of such a world as an age among many, qua Weltalter. As Benjamin writes to Gershom Scholem, who also wanted to read Kafka in the manner of a salvation history, Kafka's creatures demand to be read as bearers of a hope that may well be infinite in quantity, yet nevertheless not for us. 
Only so, Benjamin argues, is Kafka's pre or primordial world, Ovid, recognizable as a secret present that operates as, quote, the historical philosophical index of a realm where guilt and shame is no longer simply a private matter. Of course, and this is the second aspect of interest regarding this exchange, Adorno also seeks the point where guilt becomes a societal question, for which reason he insists that the concept of the age of the world as such, Weltauze, be understood dialectically in the Hegelian sense, quote, even if also found in the Jewish tradition. Benjamin says something wholly decisive, Adorno writes, when he identifies in Kafka an entanglement of the Schränkung of the German and the Jewish, which Adorno takes to mean grounds for a secularized and therefore generalized reading of the end of history. In contrast, Benjamin finds Kafka to have touched or berührt the ground of both Germanness and Jewishness, as quote, through his figures of distortion, which hint at a not entirely other world condition in which no question arising from the projection of the final judgment onto the course of the world finds a place because the unanswerability of any such question, whether the law was indeed just, whether the executor of the law will turn out to be the accused, what consequences our actions may incur, all these suspend, there's, there's, suspend the relevance and force altogether. Guilt is thus not a private matter for Benjamin because the distortion it presents as is what we gather of the most elemental ways our life and work are organized, in respect to which the German-Jewish entanglement is one manner of posing or imposing the question of the destination. Therefore, and this is the third point I want to draw out from this episode, Benjamin locates the ground of both Germanness and Jewishness in something that is neither German nor Jewish, but drawn from another Weltzustand altogether, China. To illustrate a world where every insignificant movement sets age-old relations into hugely consequential motion as if by fate, and conversely, where no action begets a consequence, Benjamin compares Kafka's figures to the characterless Chinese sage and non-symbolic gestures typical of Chinese theater, to China's answers to cult, and to the Taoist principle of non-action. Regarding this fact, Adorno makes just one cursory remark. That were one to seek the ground of Kafka's gestures, one might do much better to search not in Chinese theater, but in quote unquote modernity, which suggests two things. First, that the inconsequential Weltalter conjured by Kafka's figures are a function of modernity's dying language, rather than any sort of unacknowledged or unprocessed eruption of other worlds and times into modernity. And second, that China does not belong in, a, in modernity but is at most a conjured figment of the Zeitgeist imagination. Yet, China is not just a heuristic device for Benjamin, but as we shall see, a deliberately selected source of ideas concerning a world condition in the present in which the relation of action to consequence is not necessarily predetermined by the perspective of salvation history. For Benjamin, China is the historical philosophical index of the place where guilt, is no longer simply a private matter, but has organized life and work such that organization itself resembles fate. That is to say, incalculable, incomprehensible in its overall design, and reliant on strategic and potentially risky alliances between any number of mutually alien groupings, and therefore relieved of the syndromes that attend considerations of blood and territorial integrity. Moreover, Benjamin was not alone in drawing on China as a political philosophical resource. At others attached in one way or another to the early years of critical theory, from Martin Buber and Ernst Bloch to Brecht and Kafka himself, turned to various philosophical texts, legends, and literary works in translation, as well as analyses of contemporary polities and society, to question of the destination of their modernity. In turn, the transmission of this knowledge about China relied on a network of intermediaries, ranging from translators and philosopher enthusiasts to former missionaries turned sinologists lectors employed by language schools to train would-be officers and tradespeople in service of the German Empire's short-lived but significant colonial political economic aspirations. In the larger project from which my presentation today is drawn, I attend to the circulation of this complex called China and foreground how it arrived in major works of modern German-Jewish thought and debates from which early critical theory emerged. My contention 
is that despite the obviously orientalist framework within, within which these images of China tended to circulate, China was also conceived in the present tense, in the sense that a particular translation was used, or a paratextual comment elaborated, or current affairs and contemporary intellectuals referenced. In what follows, I want to give a glimpse into this complex as it unfolds on a series of close readings, starting with a peculiar moment in Benjamin's Kafka essay. Part two, Chinese feelings. For in the essay, Benjamin cites just one main source on China, Franz Bosenzweig's Star of Redemption. There are three passages from the Star of Redemption that Benjamin cites a total of four times. In describing Karl Rossmann, a figure in the novel America, who performs a number of too high, time consuming, and useless leaps on a racetrack, Benjamin refers to Rosenzweig's depiction of the Chinese person's interior as devoid of character, epitomized by the stage who blurs any possible individuality. Rosenzweig writes, what distinguishes a Chinese person is something quite different from character, a wholly elementary purity of feeling. Such a purity of feeling underpins what Benjamin identifies as Chinese theater's code of gestures, which have no symbolism intended by the author at the outset, but instead have their meaning derived in, quote, their ever-changing context and experimental groupings. The Chinese, quote, elementary purity of feeling is also, in Benjamin's second citation of Wolfenstein, that which underpins what Benjamin calls Kafka's strongest gesture, shame, which far from being just an intimate reaction, is a consequential one for societies that is borne out by its propensity for moving masses of historical happenings at the scale of Weltalter and affecting a quote unquote family of indeterminate membership and dimensions, he refers to swamp world. Benjamin then likens the resultant quote seasickness on solid ground and fluctuating nature of experiences to two things, the sacred Jewish ritual of erasing sins from the book of memory and Wolzenzweig's depiction of the Chinese cult of ancestors which reinforces for Benjamin the idea that forgetting itself is never individual, but quote, mingles with what has been forgotten in the pre-world for that to form countless uncertain changing compounds that yield consist constantly new, uh, new strange products. Such mingling with ancestors in the fullness of the world brings forth the animals and creatures such as Odredek in Kafka's depictions of community. It also therefore distorts time as imagined as a linear progression of moments, which Benjamin finds epitomized in Wilson's depiction of the Tao as the quote, nothing that makes something useful and makes studying a non-action, uh, according to Benjamin, directed exclusively at not forgetting in Kafka into a possibility for redemption. Looking more closely at the start of redemption though, it is not immediately obvious how Rosenzweig supplies the reinforcements that Benjamin says he retrieves from him. Of the three parts in which the star is divided, the first, devoted to the explication of the elements or everlasting pre or primordial world, Ovid, is the one that contains all of the references to China, which in fact are references to Taoism in particular. China and Taoism play a specific role in each of the three books in this first part. In the first book on God and his being or metaphysics, China along with India are for all inspired the homes of the Eastern religions of some spirits that were bypassed by the path leading from the Greek mythical conception of God to the living God of the monotheistic religions. According to Rosenzweig, China's conception of heaven is quote, raised to be world embracing in such a way that it quote, arranged the entire universe into an enormous ball of its ruling arbitrariness leaving nothing outside of its power. Its activity is therefore the result of a simple and ever renewed negation of the nothing, as epitomized by the Tao, which is only this being effected without action, and as a result, equivalent to an empty room of non-thought. Being thusly non-generative uh, non of external form, the negation of the nothing represented by the Tao thus remains, quote, inferior to those Olympian gods who, despite remaining enclosed in their world, live because they have a concept of configuring themselves from a balance between arbitrariness and necessity. 
In book two, on the world and its meaning or metalogic, China represents a prefigural development of elementary being that, in regarding the plenitude of the world as the only real thing, turns all that is spiritual into spirits, that is, of ancestors, and overcrowds the world with their abundant particularities. The only means to overcome this concrete plenitude of becoming is, to, is discovered by Lao Tzu, who solves the, quote, mystery of ruling by proposing to configure the world without doing and without non-doing, a solution that, in returning to the, quote, nameless original ground of occurrence, cannot compete with the Greeks in guiding the species along the road to clarity. Finally, in book three on man and his self or meta-ethics, China is cast as never having cultivated the will and essence necessary for the emergence of a defiant self as epitomized by the hero of Attic tragedy, because in China, the human being is marked by feeling that has been purified of any relation to character, that is to a bearer who is endowed with the propensity to withstand encounters with moving situations without suffocating in them. In terms of the Star of Redemption's overall arc, Wilson Swag's portrayal of China is negative. At every stage of the first part's advance towards grasping God, world, and human as products of the unity of affirmation and negation, China represents one factual instance of the failure to grasp these elements as such, that is to say, systematically. With respect to the systematic progression from the nothing presupposed by all cognition to the redemptive knowledge of the all, China gives Wilson Zweig the opportunity to elaborate on some consequences of deviating from, quote, grasping the identity of identity and difference, and thus from the alternative to the path that had led, quote, the entire history of philosophy from its beginnings in Ionia to its end in Hegel. And yet, China lies precisely not on the path from Ionia to Jena. It is not even treated as an allegory for a superseded stage of development. As Wilson Zweig writes in the first book, the godheads of China and India are immense edifices built from the blocks of ancestral times. As monoliths in the cults of the primitives, they still rise up into our time. Similarly, in the second book, he writes, the least metaphysical of all systems of national ethics that of Confucius still today gives form and color to the life of the people. And in the third book, he notes that once again, India and China have shown the only two ways in which man can at all times turn away before his self when he cannot muster the courage to become tragic. In these statements, China counts among the multiplicity of the nothing that philosophy presupposes to this day, but suppressed for two and a half millennia. As such, China participates in what Wolzenzweig des describes as the star's overarching project, namely contesting the assertion of a totality of the world against the multiplicity of knowledge that has persisted from Ionia to Yina. Integral to the articulation of the nothing of our knowledge that is threefold rather than singular, moreover, China also bears a promise of definability. So what else is Wozenzweig not saying? One answer can be found in an item from the Wozenzweig collection at the Leo Beck Institute archives, which I had the opportunity to consult during my time here in the autumn. Wilson Spy kept a list of the books he read between 1916 and 1918 while at the front in Macedonia and in the run up to composing The Star starting in August 1918. On this list is a title that turns out to be the unsighted source of Wilson Spy's statement concerning the holy elementary purity of feeling of the Chinese, which Wilson Spy elaborates as follows. Something quite other than character is the mark of the Chinese man, a holy elementary purity of feeling. Chinese feeling lacks any relation whatsoever to character. It lacks, as it were, any relation whatsoever to its own bearer. It is something purely objective. It exists in the moment where it is felt and exists because it is felt. No poetry of any people so clearly mirrors the visible world and the impersonal feeling released from the poet's eye, or rather that has trickled out of it. There are verses of the great Li Taipei, which no translator dares to render without using the word I, even though in the original text, as is allowed by the peculiarity of the Chinese language, these verses do not allude to any personality, and consequently, they are purely maintained in the form of the it. So question, obviously, just to put note, someone who doesn't know Chinese, how's he talking about Chinese prosody? 
Here's my answer. Li Taipei is the courtesy name of the Tang Dynasty poet known as Li Po or Li Po, or colloqu in colloquial pronunciation, Li Bai. Bosenzweig's spelling, Li Taipei, also most closely follows the French romanization of the name. The German translators from Otto Hauser and Alfred Fauke to Hans Bethke, preferring to follow the Wade Giles romanization, Li Taipo, apart from one notable exception, namely the poet Abund, whose volume Li Taipei, published with Insel Verlag in 1916, appears on Rosenzweig's book list. Also known as Alfred Henschke, Habund was a self-described after-creator or Nachdichter who took an intentionally non-scholarly approach to translation. As he notes in the afterward to an earlier volume of Chinese poetry he rendered into German, Muffled Drum and Intoxicated Gong, with Dunkel Trommel und Gong from 1915, quote, these are by no means translations, but after creation, after creations, from the spirit, intuition, reconstruction. Some pillars of the small temple had to be moved or switched around. In this same afterward, to which is afterward to the volume Li Taipei refers his readers, Hlebun makes some observations on Chinese prosody that suggest that they, along with the poem that they refer to, are the partial source of Bosenzweig's remark that there are verses of the great Li Taipei, which no translator dares to render without using the word I, even though in the original text, as is allowed by the peculiarity of the Chinese language, these verses do not allude to any personality and consequently are purely maintained in the form of the it. The poem in question is called Improvisation. I'm gonna read my English translation of the German translation. Cloud, dress, and a flower her face, fragrances waft, amorous spring. Were she to stand on the mountain, I would not dare the ascent. When she consecrates herself to the moon, I am far away, amorous spring. So for comparison, here is the Wu text that Wolzenzweig somehow refers to, and my attempt at a literal, well, here's the Wu text. Wu text. And my, on, on the internet. <laughs> and my attempt at a literal translation of that. Um, oh, my head is covering, I can, I can, my head is covering some important part. Um, Ah, okay, thank you so much. Yeah, um, it'll, be, it'll be evident why that's the case. But, um, so here, I'm going to read my attempt at a literal translation of this, right? It's actually called the Song of Pure Tranquility, number one. Cloud recalls dress, flower recalls face. Spring wind strokes the balustrade, the dew abundant. If not at the peak of Yushan, towards Yao Tai Tower beneath the moon will be the chance encounter. So this poem in Claude Wynne's version, right, improvisation, is both included in the 1916 volume Li Taipei and cited in the afterward to Muffled Drum and Intoxicated Gong as an example of what Claude Wynne describes as a fullness of associations, tonal, imagistic, and intellectual. Because of the monosyllabism of the Chinese language, Claude Wynne argues, Words are short, succinct, and arranged one after another without any connection to one another, except for rhyme. One consequence of this monopodie, Hubbard writes, is that it gives the erroneous impression of monotony. Even though Chinese words, especially in their written form, can be interpreted in 20 different ways and through multiple senses. Therefore, to quote, render the agitation, mobility, colorfulness, and peculiarity of Chinese images, sounds, and senses with German iams, unrun verses, and platitudinous polish seems to me an unconscious falsification of the Chinese lyrical character. Hubbard's rhyming reconstruction of Levi does indeed capture something of the original, whether intentionally or not. He seems to have after created the poem's last two verses entirely. Um, by capture, I mean, so this, right? So at the top, I where transliterate, I guess, the, the Chinese, I underlined the quote unquote rhyme, right? So he's sort of reproducing that and probably not intentionally, but anyway. Um, but nevertheless, he seems to have made up the last two verses altogether. Um, but what is certain by comparison is the source of Klabun's sentiment concerning the grammatical prosodic grounds for the poem's untranslatability. The Marquis Léon d'Hervé de Saint-Denis 
Poesie de l'Epoque des Tang from 1862, which uh, gives the following rendition of the poem as part of its paratextual commentary on Li Tai Pei. So that's how he spells it, the French, right? Strophe improvisé. So I'm going to read my French translation, of the, uh, my, my English translation of the French, including the parentheses, which are in, in his original. Were he to see clouds, he thinks of her dress. Were he to see flowers, he thinks of her face. The spring wind blows on the fragrant balcony. The dew forms there abundantly. If it is not at the summit of Yushan that he sees her, it is in the tower Yao Tai that he finds her beneath the moon's beams. Hervé notes that this piece was one of those I declined to translate due to, in, due to the impossibility I felt at trying to preserve special merits that are essentially inherent to the linguistic resources in which they are composed. These involve, namely, how the verbs, substantives, and adjectives remained invariable in their written form, and how the pronouns and conjunctions were often implied with certain rules of position and construction determining just the relative value of each word. To, <laughs> to, to demonstrate this most transparently in the original, things are speaking. <laughs> Um, to demonstrate this most trans uh, transparently in what he calls a text original, Hervé writes, he marked with these parenthetical insertions the places where Chinese positional rules replaced what in French would have been pronominal phrases. Most certainly the basis for Clabon's after creation, Hervé's rendition of Levi's Song of Pure Tranquility cast it as an experiment in writing, a decision reinforced by the story of the poem's providence, which he translates in his notes. Quote, during the years of Tian Pao, the reign of Ming Huang, the emperor was in a pavilion one evening when he ordered that three pieces of paper adorned with golden flowers be presented to Li Taipei, who almost immediately offered the three pieces. So there's three improvisations in total. This is how it's supposed to be. Whereas Hervé also preserves the poem's address, however, the her in the parentheses refers to the emperor's favorite, who smilingly understands the implicit meaning of the, of the, uh, of the verses. Uh, Clavon's uh, version extracts even the verbs from the first verse, minimalizes the second to its bare bone images, and so to speak, rearranges the pillars that determine the verse lengths, such that the prosodic effect of displacing all vestige of personality into purely objective relationality is rendered rhythmically evident. Accordingly, the original text's invitation to the beloved is supplanted by Clabon's rhyme scheme, transforming it into two consecutive and symmetrical non-meetings of the she and the I. Bolsonaro's assertion that no translator dares render Li Taipei's verses without using the word I, though this is allowed in the original text, directly targets Clebon's surreptitious reintroduction of personality for the sake of, uh, of constructing a schema around rhyme and rhythm. For which I in turn speculate that Ozenzweig draws on another text that appears in his 1916 book list. The Soul of the Orient by Willy Haas a consultant for the Bureau of Islamic and Indian Affairs at the German Foreign Office during the war. The soul of the Orient attempts to explain the, quote, oriental character to Germans who might encounter various classes of Chinese people in China. So German officials, missionaries, educators, and civilians who had been sent to the German concession of Kao Chao Bay and were still there, even after the nascent Chinese Republic canceled the lease upon the outbreak of war in 1914. In other words, Haas's account was written after the, quote, ero uh, what someone has called the erosion of hierarchical binarism began to take hold during the waning years of the German colonial presence in China, and after a spirit of reciprocal exchange was supposedly being asserted. Haas's contribution to this exchange was to offer an account of behavior that contradicts the claim, quote, currently still being propagated, that China and Ger Germany and China are internally bound by a common appreciation for order as a state-preserving principle. 
During the Great Boxer Rebellion, Haas explains, Chinese servants suddenly vanished in order to fight against their former masters. After having behaved only a moment ago, such sacrifice and devotion as only a Chinese servant is capable of doing. And he explains this, due, this, this curious change of behavior due to a peculiar trait of the Oriental character. It comprises a, what he called, next to one another, Nebanananda, of obscurely connected trains of thoughts, directions of will, and emotional currents with no central eye organizing them in a form with which an Occidental person would be accustomed to predicting consistency. Separated temporally into an infinity of partial persons, the Oriental can never be fully known. Its eye is indistinguishable from its psychological contents. If indeed extrapolating from highs, Boltzmann would be suggesting that there should be no I at all in Chinese verse because the structure it reflects, as per Hervé's text original, is constructed around purely objective relations. Supported by the European experience of the Orientals' inexplicable propensity to rise up against their erstwhile masters, Haas calls the Oriental the Fleischgewalt of Sache, or the thing become flesh. These purely objective relations, so clearly mirrored in Chinese poetry, manifest as what Lundzweig elaborates as a purity of the perfectly instantaneous feeling, which, not being embodied in character, remains an upsurge without a substratum. For Haas, though, the, indistingu the indistinguishability between the eye and its content issues from Confucianism, under whose principle of filial piety active agents threaten to disappear before us into an invisible unity that stretches over from the past into future generations that treats all family members and an as an arbitrary individual. In respect to filial piety, indeed, Taoist ancestor, relation, uh, ancestor worship is just a symptom. For this reason, Haas argues, its Im impenetrability, undurchdringlichkeit, absent a reference to any organic psychic unity, which marks, their orient, which marks the oriental character rather than self-concealment or sich uh, So yeah, that's impenetrability rather than self-concealment. For Wolzenzweig, by contrast, purity of a perfectly instantaneous feeling leads directly to a self-verbogenheit that, in fact, conceals the self in self-concealment. And epitomizing this twofold in self concealment is, for Wolzenzweig, therefore not Confucius, but Lao Tzu. That great sage who he describes as having conquered China, even within China. Echoing Klabund, Wolzenzweig argues that Chinese feeling is precisely not monotonous, but rather full of agitation color, mobility, or in his terms, still had content, was still visible, could still be expressed and named. Lao Tzu's accomplishment is to have used self-concealment and namelessness rather than the confabulation of an eye to reach behind the purity and mixity of feeling and break through what Haas describes as the magic violence conjured by the oriental nebenanda of things and the monotony of its arbitrariness incalculability and fullness devoid of any organic context. This is to say that for Goldenzweig, Lao Tzu is a deeply divided character who typifies both, both typifies and exceeds the self-abnegation that prevents a deep-rooted unity of defiance from forming like it did in Greece. On the one hand, Lao Tzu is a figuration of the completely elementary purity of feeling that typifies China's characterlessness. On the other hand, or indeed in the same gesture, Lao Tzu's self-concealment itself expresses a modicum of defiance that failed to grow merely for the lack of the right soil, or perhaps for the historic lack of an adequate concept of defiance, which Wozenzweig and everyone else is therefore forced to describe as the human arrogance of the magician who by force or trickery can escape the fate that rules only over the self and is so spared the defiance of the Pharaoh. Habon and Hervé would have prepared the way for this thought. 
as the paratexts to Chinese literary translations in the 19th century will want to do, editors justified their relevance with prefatory references to China's state of upheaval in the Tang Dynasty as compared or as, as was similar to the present. And Klebun's improvisation was initially appended to the volume Muffled Drum and Intoxicated Gong, which was subtitled After Creations of Chinese War Lyric, unequivocally framing Li Taipei as an experimental poet in a time of war. Part three, coastal experiments. To be clear, there is no doubt that Olsen's Five is still caught within an Orientalist framework here inherited in part from Hegel. An addendum to Hegel's lectures on the history of philosophy opens with the statement that, quote, the first moment of the history of philosophy is so-called Oriental philosophy, but we will only speak of it in passing in order to account for the relation it stands to thought and to true philosophy. Yet even working with his limited sources, Wolzenzweig intuits a question that upends prevailing presuppositions about China and its place in non-China's coming to terms with the limitations of its categories of action and organization. Wolzenzweig's embrace of a poem composed an as an experiment in a time of war articulates a conceptual absence around a purely objective feeling that exists in the moment that it is felt and that, despite having no proper place, still rises up somehow into the present day. Indeed, the star itself might be considered a wartime experiment, having been drafted as a series of letters sent from the front, and so as a companion to another project he composed in the same years, and which he also sent back in the form of Feldpostliefe, the posthumously published work Globus, Studies Toward a World Historical Theory of Space. Globus sets up from the idea that world history is the product of territorial claims whose tea loss is an unboundedness imagined as the unpossessed sea. The sea, together with a divided land, forms earth as the driving force of historical occurrence. The eventual end of this history is a world war on two counts. A world historical transition from a past Euro uh, European epoch. I thought maybe I skipped this line. Um, so first, World War and two counts. The first one is um, uh, world historical transition from a past European epoch to a coming planetary one in, that will be inaugurated after the USA and Japan joined the war. And a closed historical space or a world or ecumene, the conception of a common world whose epochs are marked by the Christian geographical vision of the earth. Colonial imperial expansion alongside the development of Christendom does play a significant role in this narrative, as borne out by one claim in particular. After its ancient spirit religions have been drawn into the sphere of Christianity and it has entered the war, Asia will be acknowledged as the future frontier of world history and drastically alter the geophilosophical shape of the globe. The Mercator projection with which Britain imagines the Pacific on the fringes of a two-dimensional surface centered around Europe will give way once Japan and America no longer forget that they have a back and can turn around to stare each other down as future enemies. And it will be recognized that there are still ends. A world that is older than Europe and thus not reborn from it, that is Asia, and one that is younger and therefore will outgrow it, that is America, both imagining for opposite reasons that they may stand outside of Europe. And retorts echoing Sheba in the second book of Samuel, what part do we have in David or an inheritance in the son of Jesse? Helping to accomplish the new geophilosophical vision is water, the original borders of the earth, everywhere around which the sea hits the coast two or three large islands, that is how dry land is situated in the middle of the water. Thus, insofar as Germany has been building up its fleet in a bid to compete on the planetary stage, Wolzenzweig writes, Kiao Chao's occupation already delineates a, quote, field of the future and of a national societal experiment. 
Now, if China is inextricable from the coastal experiment circa 1916, then the most motivation be behind Lao Tzu's reach behind the purity and fixity of Chinese feeling, according to the star, his desire to remain nameless and hidden would also be aligned to Sheba's declaration of revolt against David and uh, the second book of uh, Samuel, which of course ends with Sheba hiding in the city before being named by Joab and then betrayed by a woman which in here to save her community. Yet, while Lao Tzu is certainly described as lacking courage, well, since I contrast Lao Tzu's self-concealment of the defiantly tragic self, whose motto, if the world should break and fall on him, may my soul die with the Philistines, pits the steadfast self against a world he brings down with him. So even despite that, the provenance of Lao Tzu's namelessness itself, though, is somewhat more complex. Borrowing the phrase hidden of, hiddenness of the self, or self, the Bogan had to self, from the afterward to Martin Bubo's translations, a uh, translation of the sayings and parables of Zhuangzi, Bolzenzweig paraphrases Bubo's own reproduction of the biography of Lao Tzu's life that is customarily included in the paratexto editions of Lao Tzu and Shou Zhuangzi, an account by the Han, his, the Han dynasty historian Sima Tian in his Records of the Historian which then Buba gives his own rendition of. The Spare's account of the historian says everything about his life. His teaching was the hiddenness of himself. To remain nameless was what he strove towards. And of his death, no one knows where he ended up. Lao Tzu was a hidden sage. Buba cites at least partially from the 1870 translation, Lao Tzu's Tao Te King by Victor von Strauss. And I give it, I give it here. It's like those um, sites, basically the second, the second part. But for Lao's namelessness, which actually is an unusually literal translation of the phrase Wu Ming from Sima Tian, Buba likely counted on the help of a person called Wang Qingdao, a language instructor from 1907 to 1911 at the Seminafi Orientalische Sprachen in Berlin, which was an institute set up to support Germany's colonial aspirations in East Asia. While in Berlin, Wang also completed a doctoral thesis in 1911, the year of the Republican Revolution, in which he defends the idea that Confucianism was not a religion, but a political theory, indifferent to whether or not the head of state had inherited the throne or was elected by the people, and therefore of significance, specifically to a post-Ting China. The published version of Wang's thesis, Confucius's idea of the state and its relation to the constitutional government, was dedicated to a fatherly friend, the, that's a quote, the German missionary Paul Kantz, who wrote a book in 1896, arguing that Christianity preserves and completes what is good, changes what is bad, and supplements what is deficient in Confucianism. In the context of a mixture of these Chinese intellectuals, Christian missionaries, the German colonial apparatus, and debates about whether the new China should establish a state religion, Wang, extols Confucianism's first principle, family, as the foundation of the state. For Wang, then, the name, specifically, is therefore essential to civic and political community, just as being nameless would presumably mean shunning the highest future organizational principle in society, ranging from the family to the relation between people and the commonwealth. From the perspective of someone who regards Confucius as a moral politician, and was mentored by a missionary seeking to identify a primordial resonance between Confucianism and Christianity, Lao Tzu would, of course, be nameless, and precisely in the sense that Sheba's disavowal of David in the way Rosenzweig cites it in the Globus is a geophilosophical gesture, not a self-concealment that hides from being named for a crime that one has committed, but a refusal of the name of David as a fatherly friend. As a rejection of the Confucian organizational principle of family, Lao Tzu's namelessness and hiddenness of self therefore do what Buba says all doing does, namely call forth the Tao of the world, the Tao of things, and to make living and reveal the dormant unity that is a different principle for organizing the world. Boltzweig's version of this doing takes the form of a love, which by letting all things go and like the original ground itself, by being beyond doing and not doing and practicing not doing helps all creatures to their doing. 
and, as it were, redeems them without a salvational horizon. For his part, Buba refers back to a passage from the Tao Te Ching to illustrate the hidden life that transitions not from isolation to sermon, but rather to the isolation of fullness, from the isolation of the abyss to the isolation of the sea. Well, I am forgotten like the sea, says Lao Tzu, ruminating on how, having let go all things, he is now absorbed in a primordial state that is nevertheless not at a standstill and driven forth or even by wind and wave. Like the sea, Lao Tzu is a future from behind the past. He shows, as Lodensvai writes, a way in which man can at all times turn away before his self when he does not have the courage to become tragic. That is to say, to be transhistorical in a way being tragic is not. As another of Buba's sources writes in his afterword to a translation of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu would have to be a distant descendant of Nietzsche, or China is 30 centuries beyond Europe. So to conclude, let me just return to a scenario adjacent to the one with which I began, namely the exchange between Benjamin and Adorno. In the first course that he ever taught at the University of Frankfurt, which was a seminar devoted to Benjamin Trauschwil book in the summer of semester of 1932, Adorno refers to several passages in which Benjamin draws on Rosenzweig's Star of Redemption, and specifically those adjacent to discussions that immediately proceed from the characterization of Laos's self-concealment. These are namely the passages of the tragic hero's silence. Noting that the tragic hero is marked by his refusal of the community, Adorno surmises that the hero must remain silent because he no longer understands the world and the world no longer understands him. Therefore, the tragic hero is given up as a sacrificial victim through death. Through this then, too, though this then too acquires a societal and not just an individual significance. Therefore, guilt has a societal function and can be transformed into a historical philosophical category, wherein one sees what he says, the beginnings of the concept of natural history, which Adorno says elevates the mythic from an undialectical anthropological substratum to something dialecticized, a dialectic derived from a mutual non-understanding of human and world. Yet what if Rosenzweig's account of the tragic hero is the detour, both in the sense of Benjamin's eventual destination in the Kafka essay and the question of the relation between prehistory and modernity? The non-systematic yet complex and expansive engagement with China's and particular Taoism's time travels in various textual presences by Rosenzweig, Benjamin, and Buba, of which, by the way, there's a lot more to say, sketches out a path untaken but intuitive nevertheless from an ancient China that, through citation, was evidently modern before the arrival of Western modernity. Bypassing the formation of the self, too, Taoism's modernity invites a return of the concept of natural history to a future reimagining of how to let go objects without the convention centered around an eye that grasps, claims, and brings them before it. If for Benjamin, China is the historical philosophical index of the place where guilt is no longer simply a private matter, but has organized life and work, such that organization itself resembles fate, Rosenzweig before him intuited a mode in which a rebellion that is based on experimental groupings may yet point towards an incalculable organization of the world. Thank you.